Hey guys, we're uh, back with round six from the Reykjavik Open. Um, I had a very interesting draw with uh, GM Elshan Moradiabadi. I'm gonna show yeah, you guys some some nice lines <laughs> there. A strong player. Yeah, yeah. I was pushing, but not quite enough. And Eugene, you you had a tough day. Yeah, I lost to a uh, youngster, French grandmaster, who is rated about 25, 80 something, mm -hmm. uh, Maxime, but not MVL, <laughs> right. uh, Lagarde, and I'll show you guys my game. Um, it was a really weird opening, mm -hmm. which turned out to be, uh, which transposed into French, mm -hmm. and then he actually played really well the whole game, and maybe once I could have equalized, but... Uh, really underestimated the position. Right, right. Um, okay. Well, go ahead. Yeah. All right. So let's take a look at my game. So uh, it started out as a d4 opening. And after bishop f4, this is called the London system. But after knight c3, I mean, after d5, knight c3, e3, c5, knight c3, this is a really weird version of the London system because typically pawn goes to c3. Mm -hmm. And the idea is... If he's not careful and plays something normal, then after knight b5, black is completely lost. Yeah. Knight c7 is annoying. So usually people take on d4 first with the idea to stop this knight b5 advance. But this uh, loses some time, allows white to develop, and it's a double-edged position. Mm -hmm. Usually white can try to even cast a long here. Mm -hmm. uh, but my opponent did, after thinking for a while, did completely a mo new move to me. I didn't even know about this move. There are almost no games. c4. Wow. Um, it does make some sense because he's kind of limiting the bishop on f1, but I thought that allowing e4 in these positions should be really good for white, and that's what I played, because if he takes, he's going to lose the c pawn. Mm -hmm. And now he just plays e6. So he's basically saying, I'm playing the French, what are you playing? <laughs> <laughs> um, and I don't really have an option, I have to play e5 if I'm fighting for the advantage. So now we just go into this French, where the pawn on c4 is a little bit advanced too quickly, I would say. It's usually black wants to put as much pressure on the d4 pawn as possible. Right. But with the pawn on c4, it kind of unties white to start a quick kingside attack. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did in the game, bishop e3. It turns out, with the idea f4 or 5, it turns out this doesn't actually give any advantage. And uh, white is not better here. Wow. Uh, perhaps I should have tried uh, something else. So let's go back here. Maybe knight g2. But this really looks awkward, and maybe g3 ideas. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm not sure what, what to do here. Another interesting idea is to play bishop g5. And then if he plays bishop e7, then I play e5, and now I do get the best French, because the, the bishops get traded. Mm -hmm. So he has to be, probably play some kind of McCutcheon, and now it's very double-edged position. <clears throat> For instance, e5 is going to be met by h6, and who knows what's going on. Yeah, it's so hard to figure out these positions because it's like the pawn on c4, it's not clear if it's helping or hurting Yeah, black. it may be helping. A lot of the times in McCutcheon, they play c4 anyways. Yeah. So anyways, uh, I kind of played logical chess and I got a big time advantage because he was thinking for a long time at every move. Uh, by the way, I cannot take on b5 because rook b8. Mm -hmm. And he played b4. It's okay. You can play it. I thought he played rook b8 first. I kind of played natural moves. And f5 is really strong. This is a typical French idea. Yeah. En passant doesn't work because he can now take with the with the knight. Uh, and then I don't really have anything. It just comes into e4. e4, yeah. So I just basically play the best moves according to the engine, but it's only good enough for quality. And he correctly transfers to bishop to e8. So if I ever play g4, he can actually just put the bishop on g6. And now I have to watch out for him taking on g4 at the right moment. I'm not better here. Yeah. My pieces are really awkwardly placed for the attack. Hmm. Uh, so that's why I didn't want to commit with g4. So I played this, logical move, a5, and bishop f2, a4, knight d1. Already probably dubious plan. I should have admitted that I have no advantage and gone for some equality like this. Mm -hmm. So you see, guys, sometimes you got to admit your mistakes and just hold the fort, as they say. Just stay put. Yeah. Stay put. Don't do anything drastic. Black can't really improve his position either. But I would say it's roughly equal. Uh, so what I did is I'm trying to still play for a win for the initiative. So King H8 was again a very smart move because if I play G4, he can actually just take it. And if I take, he's going to win the F-pawn. So a knight takes G4 is not what I had in mind because then the bishop gets open. Right. So I'm kind of puzzled here what to do, how to make progress. 
Hmm. So again, I should admit that I have no advantage. You just play something solid. You know, he can't really break through. Neither side can do much. Uh, positions roughly equal. Mm -hmm. So I'm um, again trying to create something out of nothing. Uh, G3 with the idea of rook G2 and double up and play G4. But that gives him time to regroup. Again, this is the last opportunity for me to just buckle down. Mm -hmm. I do this. And you see guys now with this very thematic idea. A3, he takes over the initiative. It's a very important pawn sacrifice. I have to take, and now knight's coming in. I did this, the other knight's coming in. Again, I don't have time for any g4 business, and now I just have to defend. So I buckle down and defend pretty accurately for a while. So this is all... So he sacks two pawns. Yeah, but he's getting one of them get back immediately. Squares, yeah. yeah. So he gets one of them immediately. He gets, like, tons of counterplay. But pawn is a pawn. If I can simplify, I'll be pawn up. And here I made a pretty serious uh, blunder or mistake. I played rook g1 quickly in time pressure, mm -hmm. but it actually lo loses an important tempo and weakens the second rank. The correct move is knight a3. And if he takes, I can just hold this equal position. Takes, 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 and this, and this is just a draw. Mm -hmm. Takes, takes. Neither side can win. Yeah. So yeah, that was a time pressure blunder on my end. I should have played knight a3 and drawn the game. Mm -hmm. He played, after rook g1, he played perfectly to not give me any counterplay. Queen d3, rook, rook's coming to b2. Again, I wish I would have traded queens. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, I should have tried this move to murk the waters. I didn't want to see it in time pressure. And with idea f5, mm -hmm. like who knows what's going on. At least I'm getting some kind of counterplay while his pieces on the other side. Yeah, that's true. This can still go wrong for uh, black. But I think this is the right move. And little by little, mm -hmm. you know, some practical chances, but really complicated position. Anyway, so I played queen f1, uh, where it's still in time pressure mode, and he correctly avoids the repetition and plays queen b3. Now I'm pretty much lost. Um, I had to find, there is one more opportunity to this. I played knight g2, which loses, but this move rook a1, a computer move, I don't even know how it holds, but it says <laughs> it's close to equality. Yeah, it seems so tough. It just makes no you're... sense to just put the rook in the middle of, of kind of, not even attacking the bishop. <laughs> But I guess he can't really do any, any damage. And the idea that I missed is quite strong, this queen a3 move. A lot of the times the queen covers f8 square, which is vital when I get knight g5 going. And that was my kind of idea, but it doesn't work. And I realized that he just plays h6, and if I do this move, that was my intention. Then he has this, and the queen is covering f8 square. Mm -hmm. you can just take. Yeah. So I tried uh, kind of this last ditch effort and with the idea queen d8 but he simply stops it here if checked on king h7 and the bishop moves he's just gonna win easily um, for instance here 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 something like queen e3 followed by knight e3 mm -hmm. and this is just game over yeah it's just hopeless yeah, for the, the pin is too strong so i tried this queen g6 nonsense which probably doesn't really work he correctly just takes the bishop and after that i just resign there is no perpetual, not even close. Okay. Right. So, you know, hats off to my opponent. He played a really good game. That c4 move definitely caught me by surprise. And I should have really tried to held things together, not gone any, you know, rook g3, rook g2, just kind of stayed put. And uh, probably I would hold the equality. Yeah, it was like a nice French for him. Yeah, and by the way, he is a French player. Even though he is from France, he does play the French. <laughs> Wow. So he actually so he tricked was, me. He was at home. In, in, yeah, in his kind of home turf. But he was taking way too much time mm -hmm. and every move. So I thought he really didn't know what he was doing, but he actually knew exactly what he was doing. He just wanted to make sure he didn't blunder anything. Right, right. Okay, well, let me save All this right. game. All right, so I'll go rest up and Kost is going to show you his game. Awesome. All right. Well, as mentioned, I, um, I drew with Elshan who is a good friend of mine and um, I think we've only played one time before and he uh, he just won easily with black so this game I wanted to basically put up more of a fight and and try to uh, try to create chances of my own um, so he went for this line with uh, Queen's Indian and the double Fianchetto with g6 a lot of times um, you can get the line from kind of a typical Queen's Indian move order with e6 and um, 
this is one of the lines I was expecting, so I was kind of familiar with some of the ideas here. Um, but he went with this move order where he saves on the move e6. And it definitely makes a difference because he doesn't have to play this move in the game, but I think white is still um, has good chances to fight for uh, advantage here. Um, well, I play queen c2, and um, well, if you guys want more details on the opening, um, I plug this at least once per video. <laughs> and I uh, started a new Patreon page where I'm uploading a lot of chess analysis as well as um, analysis of my games and particularly the openings. So if you guys are more curious and want to see a little bit more detail about the opening line, make sure to check out that page and I'll link to it below. Um, so c5 and uh, yeah, I think this is a very normal move. He's trying to force me to define the center a little bit. I advance with d5, uh, e6, and e4. And I felt like I, I had a good... Um, actually a really good opening here because after e takes d5 e takes d5 we're getting one of these benoni structures uh you can call it a symmetrical benoni but the bishop on b7 is is not happy to be placed here against the pawns on c4 and d5 um black's only way to kind of break out is to play b5 which i was expecting and i was most likely going to play knight to c3 here and the idea being after b takes c4, my d5 pawn is hanging, I have the move knight d2. So I defend the pawn on d5, I'm going to take on c4 with this knight, and I think white has a, a normal game. Um, but he said he played knight a6, knight c3. Now he can gain a tempo with knight to b4, but I think I'm just going to play queen d1 here. The next move I'll play a3 and the knight will just have to kind of go back anyways. Um, so he played d6. Bishop f4, I think I think this is the best spot for the bishop, just targeting d6, and knight c7. So structurally, this is a really interesting position because we have the symmetrical structure, white has a little bit more space, and um, it, it's not clear if, if black's position, <laughs> or what, what black is really trying to do here. Um, because white has more space, he can try to build up, but for black, this knight on c7 and this bishop on b7, they're really stuck. And so if black never gets the move b5 and under you know good circumstances, then these pieces just end up being really, really passive. And a lot of times white can win here either by dominating the e-file or by going for this plan, knight g5, knight e4, and targeting the d6 pawn, which is difficult to defend. Um, but it's a still a very tough position for white to win. A lot of times you have to attack on the king side, and as we'll see, you have to be uh, very, very precise. Um, so I, I chose the move a4, which I think is quite logical because I'm preventing b5. And uh, now if black plays a6, I'm not exactly sure what I would have done in the game, um, but one of my main ideas was to play rook ae1, and after b5 is to just hold things together with b3. And so if he takes on c4, I recapture, and he hasn't really made a whole lot of progress because he doesn't have a good way to kind of reorganize his pieces and get counterplay. Um, without the pawn on a6, he would have bishop a6, which is kind of annoying, but even then I play knight b5, and it's not clear what black has achieved. So he went back knight a6, which is uh, definitely a common maneuver for Benoni players, where they play knight c7, they induce this move a4 without having to play a6, and then they bring the knight back to b4. But my understanding is, whenever this knight comes to b4, if white can comfortably put the queen on d2, then this knight be ends up being out of the game because it just has no squares to jump to. It can be a little bit annoying sitting there on b4, but if the fight is taking place on the king side, then uh, the knight is too far. So I play queen d2, knight b4, and rook ae1. I think it's very important to use this rook because the rook on f1, in some cases, I'll throw my f pawn forward if I can get my pieces out of the way and the rook will be very useful. But I mainly use this rook because if rook fe1, I'm always going to have to consider some kind of uh, all, all these forks with knight c2. So my queen doesn't really have uh, the freedom to, to move so easily here. So rook ae1. And with this move, I'm definitely announcing my intentions to, to go for the king side. Uh, he played a6. I think this is important. Otherwise, knight b5 is going to be a, a real problem. Um, and here I play knight to g5. So thematic move, we mentioned this before. I want to put my knight on e4, and if he's forced to play like knight to e8, 
and that's really passive and white can continue with bishop g5 or bishop h6 and uh, I think black is a tough defense. As long as these two pieces on b4 and b7 are out of the game I think white is definitely happy here and that was kind of my whole strategic idea. Uh, so he played knight h5 which I was definitely uh, expecting because otherwise um, knight e4 comes and again d6 is very hard to defend. Bishop e3 and now h6 so he's kicking my knight and this was the first moment of the game where I felt like I missed something really strong. Um, I really wanted to put the knight on e4 because of course the knight is more active than just going back to h3 or f3 but after knight g e4 I didn't know what to do after the move f5. It seems like the knight is just trapped. Uh, I definitely considered to sack by taking on h6 um, but after f takes e4 I, I didn't see exactly that I'm getting enough here. Let's say bishop takes and even a move like king h7 or queen f6 might be um, might be a good way to hold here and white has only gotten two pawns for the piece and uh, it's not really enough. Um, I don't have I don't have such an easy way to, to create any more threats. So f5 looked like just kind of a refutation of this move because I'm, I'm forced to give up a piece, um, but I missed a really strong resource g4. And uh, if I found this move, I definitely would have gone for the line because now um, black's position is, is kind of collapsing. This is a really, really strong counterattack. If he takes on e4, I'll take on h5. Now I want to take the e4 pawn, and even if a move like knight d3 happens, uh, I'm very willing to give up this exchange because the position we get after rook takes c1, I think black's king just ends up being extremely weak. Uh, we're threatening bishop takes h6, this bishop on b7 is still out of the game, and we have bishop h3, bishop e6 ideas. I think white just has a huge initiative here. And after g5, of course, we can play the move h4 just to uh, break everything open, and I think white's pieces just take over here. Um, after g4, if he takes on g4, the idea is that now, now, of course, my knight's not hanging on e4, so I can safely take on h6, and the position is opening up. Um, I'm threatening to trade and then put my knight on g5 and then to e6, and the king side is opening up, and the fact that his knight is still on b4, bishop on b7, means this has to be good for white, especially if my bishop ever arrives on uh, e4. So I missed this resource, and that would have given white a big advantage, almost, almost decisive, I think. Um, he's not forced to play f5, um, but I am threatening now to play g4 anyways, and then g5, and kind of similar to what happened in the game, except here, my knight on e4 is a lot more active. And he has to do something about the h6 pawn. So if he plays king h7, I play g4, he plays knight f6, I play g5. Take, we take with the bishop. And now this pin is incredibly annoying. Queen f4 is a very standard idea in these positions, threatening queen h4 as well as just taking on f6. And black can get out of the pin with knight takes e4, counterattacking the queen, but we just simply recapture f6, bishop f4, and the d6 pawn uh, cannot be defended. If black does not play f6 but plays a move like queen d7, well then white just gets an immediately uh, decisive attack with queen f4 and the knight f6 check, queen h4, and black just gets mated here. It's very, very uh, straightforward stuff. Rook e3, rook h3. So that was my first uh, miss. And instead I dropped back to f3, um, but I had some aggressive ideas in mind, so I didn't feel like I'm just retreating here because I have induced him to play h6 and this is now uh, definitely weakness. So he played king h7. He could also play g5, but this would be really bad after h4. And in case of g4, which is a lot of times going to be kind of forced here, I can either sack on h6, giving up the piece for two pawns, but I'm getting a tempo against the knight, I have knight e4 coming, or even rook e4. I felt like white has a very strong attack here, and the engine thinks black is just barely holding on. Um, or after g4, I can even drop back with knight h2, and uh, he has two pawns under attack. And so this is just a much simpler solution, and, and white is just winning a pawn here. Um, so king h7, I, I think, was definitely kind of forced in this position. Now it comes g4, he goes back, and immediately g5. I could also kind of slow play it with h3, and I thought about this quite a lot, because I can play like knight h2 here, or knight h4, and then launch the f-pawn forward, 
Um, and even though this is very slow, a lot of times white just has the time to do this because he's under control and black doesn't have any uh, immediate counterplay. But I wasn't sure. Bishop c8, I felt like I'm getting more with the immediate g5, and so I, I decided I should just take my chance. Um, now things got really interesting. h takes g5, bishop takes g5. I could also take with the knight, and I think I have um, a pretty significant advantage here after this move, bishop f4, and I'm just reverting to my old idea of playing knight g4 and going after that d6 pawn. Um, the key point here is that if black plays knight h5, which I was concerned about during the game, at, at this point I can let him take my bishop and get my queen in and play a move like knight c4, which uh, I saw this idea on another line, but not here, and I think this is a really instructive moment because usually we don't want to give up such a nice bishop, but after queen takes f4, there's a lot more going on here. Number one, we're hitting the d6 pawn, but we're also threatening queen h4 with a mating attack. And if black's queen moves, then we're going to have knight f6 in the position too. So white just has a decisive advantage here. I think the, the attack is too strong. Uh, especially queen h4 is a very, very annoying uh, threat to meet. And then if black ever plays rook e8, we'll just play f4, f5, queen h7 check. And I mean, the position uh, basically plays itself. So that was definitely a very significant option. Um, I took with the bishop in order to establish this pin and make room for this idea with queen f4. Um, and now he played bishop c8. And I think this was another critical moment for me um, because he, he found a really good defensive move. I, I would say probably the only move. He's putting the bishop on f5 and this blocks the queen on f4 and it also hits the e4 square and threatens to get this knight on b4 back in the game as well because with this bishop on f5, he's always going to be threatening knight d3 or knight c2, knight d4, things like that. Um, so I realized it was a critical moment and uh, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what to do. Um, my first instinct was to play queen f4, which turns out to be the best move. Because after bishop f5, um, I, I think white just gets a, a very, very strong uh, initiative here. I can play knight h4. I think I can also, let's say, give check first, king to g8. And now this pin is just so annoying for black that because he can't move the queen now, the knight on f6 is always hanging. So even a move like knight e4 here might just be uh, game over. He's forced to take, rook takes, then the rook comes to f4, and I don't see how he defends the knight on f6. So queen f4 looked really good. The problem is I just couldn't figure out what to do against knight h5. Um, and it turns out uh, the engine agrees with me. After any other move except knight h5, white just has an immediately decisive advantage. Um, but as it turns out, after knight h5, I have a really nice way here to get a big plus. Not exactly winning, but a big advantage. So if you guys want, this is a good uh, puzzle to pause the video on and, and try to find uh, the best move here for white. Okay. Well, the first thing we would want to check is bishop takes d8. What happens if we just trade queens? Well, knight takes f4. I can play bishop e7. And I wasn't so convinced by this because even though I win the d6 pawn, black is getting a lot of counterplay with either knight d3 or knight c2. And you can take the b2 pawn. My bishop on g2 is kind of hanging. You know, I don't want to give this piece up and allow his bishop in. So even if white ends up, up a pawn here, but I have to give up my light squared bishop, I felt like black is um, doing quite well here. Maybe rook to e8, bishop takes d6, and uh, I'm not sure what move to play. Maybe earlier black should have traded on g2. King takes g2, rook e8, bishop takes d6, and like bishop g4, or even bishop f5. I feel like black just gets a very easy counterplay here with the two bishops, and... Um, yeah, I just wasn't sure about this during the game. So bishop takes d8 is not so clear. The second most natural move would be queen h4. Uh, but the problem here is that black plays f6. I have to drop back with the bishop. And I didn't see exactly how I'm going to be targeting this knight on h5. I mean, black's king looks weak, but I don't have a g-pawn <laughs> to play g4 anymore. And so this knight on h5 is kind of holding everything together. Meanwhile, black is ready to play knight d3, knight e5 and get his pieces back into the game. Now the danger here for white is if I allow his knight to get to e5, allow his bishop to come out, white can easily immediately end up worse here because black's pieces can get a, a lot of activity very quickly. 
So what did I miss? Well, it turns out white has this amazing trick, queen takes f7. And I've definitely seen, you know, desperado tactics like this before, but in this position, I, I didn't even consider it. Um, and it's only because black played bishop to c8 on the previous move. So after rook takes f7, bishop takes d8, white has won a pawn, but more importantly, we have threats in the position. We're now threatening knight g5 check, winning the exchange, and we're winning to, threatening to take a second pawn with bishop takes b6. And so here, black's pieces are not coordinated. I have knight g5 coming, rook e8 is an idea. Um, this would be a big advantage for white almost winning. So that was, that was the second kind of key idea I missed. And I think if I found this or if I found uh, g4 in the other line, I would have had really, really good chances of, of winning this game. Um, another good move was knight h4 here. And I think I should have played this. You know, you're, you're not going to see every tactic in the position. But strategically, this move makes a lot of sense. Because I stop bishop f5. And I'm ready to play f4 and f5 and start opening up black's king. And I think white has a serious edge here as well. Like rook e8, f4. Okay, eventually I ended up going on knight e4, which gives away pretty much all of my advantage. Um, but my idea was to just start activating my pieces, trying to trade stuff off on the king side and leave black with this knight on b4. So he trades, hitting the queen. And I think he was quite relieved here to be able to break this pin, which is another reason why the move knight e4 is probably not the best way to fight for an advantage. Uh, now after f6, I realized that if f takes g5, my knight gets into the attack with check, and I thought I might have some really interesting attacking ideas here. So I played the move rook fe1. Now to be honest, I actually wasn't 100% sure about this piece sack, but I felt like um, I do get a ton of play, and most likely it just looks so dangerous that, that Elshon wasn't going to go for it. Um, but the line itself is very interesting, so if black ends up taking on g5, my first instinct was to just take the pawn is actually quite bad because after king to g8, rook e7, white's idea is to just dominate the king side and try to bring the queen in uh, over to the h file. But the problem is this move bishop f6 and I just have too much stuff hanging here and white doesn't get anything and is just, just down a piece. Instead, hopefully I would have figured this out during the game, white should start with the move rook e7. And this does cause black some, some serious issues. Uh, the bishop is pinned. I'm threatening uh, moves like queen c3 right away, as well as taking on g5 now. Uh, I think king g8 is the only move here to immediately get out of the pin. Then after queen takes g5, white has a pretty strong attack. Um, the threat is either queen takes g6 or even queen h4, knight g5, and uh, just mating. So I think black has a defense here, but they would basically have to find only moves to, uh, to hold it. Instead, Elshon played rook a7, which I, I think was the, practically speaking, uh, better move, just immediately covering the seventh rank and renewing the threat on the bishop. Um, and here it's really a critical moment for white because dropping back, I think, is the best choice, but you have to realize that black is ready to come out with bishop f5, and then once the rook moves back, the knight either comes to c2 or d3 and starts causing real problems. So here I took a long thing because I realized that the next move I make is gonna set the course for a for, uh, big portion of the game. I play bishop f4, bishop f5, and uh, rook e6. Uh, I felt like I had to sacrifice the exchange at this point in order to kind of keep the initiative. If, if I go back, I think black immediately takes over with knight d3. And then I have to move my rook, he can take my bishop. And this is not a case where white is happy to give up the bishop because black immediately kind of takes control over the game. He's gonna fight for the e-file next move and I think white is just uh, seriously worse here if not uh, outright lost. So I'm forced to, to do something dynamic. Um, now I was really hoping that he would just defend the pawn with rook to d7 and kind of leave this rook hanging uh, on e6. A lot of players, they like to do this, you know, not accept the sacrifice. Um, but here I have a, a really fantastic idea with knight to d4. And now it's too late to take the rook because I'm ready to recapture with the knight. I'm also threatening to take the bishop. Black is forced to take on d4. I take this knight on b4. 
And if he takes the rook now, I'm happy to take with the pawn, and then I'm going to win the d6 pawn next move, and I'm, I'm getting more than enough compensation for the exchange here. And this bishop can come to d5, and black's position is just going to be uh, pretty much hopeless. So I was really hoping to get knight d4 in the game, um, but I think from here, Elshon actually defended very, very nicely. He takes the rook right away. Um, here I'm forced to take with the rook because after d takes e6, he can break free with d5. And uh, I wasn't sure about this position at all because e7 is, is not happening. If c takes d5, um, he can play knight takes. And I feel like he's under control here, although maybe maybe I missed some, some tactical idea. But rook takes e6 kind of keeps the uh, keeps a lot of compensation for white. And my main idea is that I, I've given up a full exchange, but the knight on b4 is really misplaced. So as far as the king side is concerned, if we cut the board in half, um, I have a lot more pieces playing on this side of the board. Basically two pieces versus the rook. So I felt like I have pretty decent compensation here. And um, I do have a lot of ideas to start targeting black's king, like knight h4, bishop e4, or even h4, h5, and just opening everything up. Um, so he played rook e8, which is uh, definitely a smart move, trying to trade off my, my active rook. If I take on d6, I'm actually not exactly sure what his idea was. I think it was most likely to play rook to d7. And uh, if we trade rooks, queen comes out, and I've gotten a pawn for the exchange, but now his pieces are ready to come out and start dominating. So queen f5, his knight can get to d3, and um, my minor pieces aren't really doing a whole lot. The d5 pawn is, is going to be under control. So I have to keep the, the bind. Bishop h3. And uh, here he traded. I take with the bishop. And now this was definitely a critical moment for black. Although I would say all these moves are, are critical. Um, now that my bishop is sitting on e6 covering the g8 square, of course I'm looking to, to transport my queen to the h file as quickly as possible. And I had this idea in mind to play queen to e3 move the knight somewhere with the discovered attack, and then play queen to h3. And this would basically be giving white a decisive attack. So if black played the move rook e7 here, which I was kind of expecting, um, then queen e3 is very strong. And now any move he makes, knight e5 is coming. Even this move, knight c6, it's kind of a funny idea. Um, the point being, if I take, he has uh, queen e8, but knight c6, I just immediately throw in knight e5 as promised. And uh, there's no good defense to, to queen h3 next move, as well as just taking this knight on c6. And so black is just lost. And if rook takes e6, it's important that I'm getting everything with check. Queen h3 check, queen takes e6 check, and then I take the knight and game over. But he found the only move here, queen f8. And the idea is to challenge with bishop to h6. And this is just around move 30, we're both approaching time trouble, and things get really, uh, really wild here. So I came up with this move, queen to c3, because uh, I realize we can trade the dark squared bishops, but as long as this knight on b4 stays out of play, I will have compensation. And the idea behind putting the move, the queen here, is to target the f6 pawn. So now if bishop h6, and I take, queen takes allows me to take on f6. So this actually happened in the game. I was expecting king takes h6 to be played, and my idea against this move is to start attacking with knight h4. Uh, and then after the game, Elstrom and I went over, uh, he felt like this position was, was very, very dangerous for black, because my queen is coming to g3, and I'll be eyeing the d6 pawn, I'll be eyeing the g6 pawn, and it's very difficult for black to defend both. Um, for example, if he goes back with king to g7, I already play queen to g3. And if queen e8, I can take on d6, or even give knight a 5 check. Uh, if g5, I come in with knight a 5, I take on d6, and my pieces are, are breaking through. It turns out, black could play this way, but he had to find the move king h7, which I actually completely missed. Uh, and I think I think Elshon did as well, because otherwise he, he likely would have won for this line. Um, now queen g3 is met with queen h6, and if I take on d6, well then he comes in with queen c1, and he gets a lot of counterplay, and then queen g5 check as well. Um, so, <laughs> it's funny arrows, but um, yeah, I think this would have been pretty decent for black, and then after queen g3, queen h6, I have this amazing move knight f5, 
uh, because I have mate on g8 and uh, things would be pretty messy here. I think the computer gives black a small edge, um, but that means that white will have some compensation because we are down the full exchange. Um, instead, queen takes h6 was played. And I was very surprised because I thought after queen takes f6, queen c1, check, king g2, black has no checks here, and I mean, white is ready to just play like knight g5 and go for an easy mating attack. Um, but then Alshon played this move on the board, knight to d3, and I was really shocked that he could go for this because uh, to me it looked like <laughs> this position had to be winning for white. I mean, we have so many checks, and black's counterplay just seems kind of vague you know he, he might have a check or two but as long as we find a safe score for the king uh the queen and knight you know are not going to be able to to win the game on their own uh, amazingly white has no win here and and if you guys want you can plug this position into your engine and, and check it out um but <laughs> somehow everything works for black it, black ends up being perfectly coordinated the rook on a7 is of course a big hero defending the seventh rank and this knight on d3 queen on c1 turn out to be very well coordinated as well um, black is ready to play queen takes b2, which we'll see is a very important defensive resource. And he's also potentially threatening uh, knight f4 check. Not potentially, he is definitely threatening this, because king g3, knight h5 check wins the queen. Okay, so my first instinct was of course to play knight g5 check. King h6 is forced. And I was looking for a mate in this line, but the king runs away. It's just going to go through e4, d4, take on c4, and black is going to emerge with an extra rook. So this is uh, lost for white. I, I really checked this a number of times, but there is just no mate to be found. And unfortunately for me, the queen on c1 is defended. Otherwise, in any of these lines, queen g5 or earlier queen h6 check would have just picked up the queen. But this knight on d3 is, uh, is a beast covering everything. So the direct line wasn't working for white. And uh, eventually I found h4, which I, I thought was definitely good enough for equality, but I realized that it might not be winning. Um, the move looks really strong because queen h8 is just this huge threat. And if he gives any checks like knight e1 check, king g3, black runs out of checks and uh, basically has to resign because this threat is, is too strong. Um, if knight f4 check, eh, I can go to h2. And again, queen h8 is uh, just too serious of a threat. But of course, he found the only move. Queen takes b2, covering queen h8 check. Now I'm forced to give check on f8. Um, if king h5, this is simply bad after queen to f3. So queen g7 was played. Um, rook g7 is queen h8, and that would be a big problem. So queen g7, queen takes d6, and now queen f6. So I think black here really just found some incredible moves here to defend his king. Uh, and now he has a lot of counterplay. He's hitting f2. He has knight f4 check. I believe I found the only move here with knight to e4. Uh, hitting the queen and defending the f2 pawn. And there was one, one more try here for black. He could have gone for this queen f4 move, which actually forces the endgame. Because he's also hitting the knight and he's covering any checks. But I... I felt that this endgame is actually going to be very promising for white, and Nelshon felt the same. Um, because we have a pawn now for the exchange, and white's king gets in very, very quickly. So if black takes on e6, we take with the pawn. Rook e7, we have knight to g5. And amazingly, everything works out for white. The knight is protected by the pawn, it's defending the e6 pawn, and this king is running to d5, either to <laughs> push the rook back or to take all of black's queenside pawns. Um, the computer here shows that black can actually hold in this key position with this amazing move rook to e8. And the idea is to play rook to h8 and get counterplay against the h4 pawn. And concretely, um, this should end in a draw. And immediately white can repeat moves with check and then back to knight g5. And then I think king f6 is probably black's uh, best move here just to repeat the position. Um, if black does not take on e6 and, and moves the knight, let's say, to d3, then I think I push d6. And uh, this pawn is just really strong. So I have king e3 coming. Um, I have d7 if he doesn't stop it. And then at some point, if the knight moves away, I can even play a5, take on c5, and get two connected passers. Although that would be definitely a risky idea. But if my king is uh, nicely centralized, then 
it's really only white who's pushing for an advantage here. So this would have been really risky uh, for black. And uh, instead of black play queen to d4, um, this allows me to give check on f8. And we ended up repeating moves here uh, with queen d6, queen e5, and queen f8 check. So objectively speaking, the, the position here is just drawn. Uh, after queen to d6, black doesn't really have anything better than either of these moves, queen e5 or queen to d4. And then white doesn't have anything better than to repeat moves with uh, queen f8 check going for this uh, perpetual. So uh, I thought it was a really interesting game. And even though I missed one or two chances to kind of really get a big advantage, uh, I definitely found some really strong ideas here. So I was, was happy with how I played. Uh, Elshon definitely took a lot more risk uh, because uh, the tournament situation, this is an open tournament and he has to play for a win with black. Uh, and I think that's why he kind of went for this somewhat dubious setup. But he was, of course, trying to create winning chances and, uh, well, came up with a very interesting game. But uh, all right, guys, hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we have three more rounds to go in this uh, open tournament. Um, maybe not as interesting to follow as the, uh, the candidates, but we're, we're definitely playing some, some uh, very, very interesting chess in Reykjavik. So until next time, take care.